What's up YouTube, I'm Guy, and today on the channel we are going to finally be reviewing a Grand Seiko, but not just any Grand Seiko, probably what most people would consider the Grand Seiko. What we're checking out today is the SBGA211, the Grand Seiko Snowflake. Very, very happy to have this watch here today to review. It feels like it's been forever, I've been wanting to get one in. A lot of you guys have been asking me to check them out and to give you my thoughts and opinions on it. Well, today is finally the day. A couple of things before we jump over to the tabletop and take a close look at this watch. Number one, I have to thank my friends over at Exquisite Timepieces. They are a local authorized dealer in the Naples, Florida area, a brick and mortar store that has been in business for over 20 years. They carry over 50 different watch brands, including Grand Seiko. And they also have an extremely wide selection of pre-owned watches. If you're interested in learning more about Exquisite Timepieces, I encourage you to go over to exquisitetimepieces.com and check out their website. If you happen to call them up and speak to Evan over there, let him know that you heard about their business through Guy and the Just Bluefish channel. Hopefully they'll continue to loan me watches in the future. You might have also noticed that I am wearing a Seiko shirt today. There's a little uh, Seiko Turtle dive watch here, an emblem on this shirt. This was sent over to me from another YouTuber, uh, Watch Collecting Strategy. Sorry, I almost forgot there for a second. Watch Collecting Strategy channel is uh, another watch YouTube channel, and Abe over there was kind enough to ask me if I would like to have one of the watches that he custom designed. I believe he sold out of them. I'm sure he'll make more or different designs in the future, but if you're not familiar with Watch Collecting Strategy, go over and check out his channel. He makes great videos and uh, he's kind of a buddy of mine now. When you think Rolex, you probably think Submariner. Maybe you think Datejust, but probably Submariner. When you think Omega, you probably think Speedmaster. When you think Grand Seiko, do you think the Snowflake? That's what I think when I think of Grand Seiko. I actually did a collection review for a viewer a while back, and in that collection, well, the, the, the premise of the review was he wants to remove a couple watches or a watch from his collection because he just had recently added a watch. In that collection, he had two Grand Seikos, neither of which was the Snowflake. And I said, to me, the answer to your question is to remove those two Grand Seikos and get the Grand Seiko Snowflake. It is the icon. It is the blue chip Grand Seiko watch to own. I feel that way about this watch. I always have. And uh, I know a lot of you guys feel that way too. Now, since it is the icon Grand Seiko and it is coming out of exquisite timepieces, new inventory, I'm going to be extremely careful with this watch. This will be the first of any review that I've worn white gloves, yeah, I'm going to throw on the gloves to make sure that I don't scratch or damage this watch in any shape or form, so don't be surprised when you see that. I am going to move the cameras over here to the tabletop, and we are going to check it out up close. All right, guys, here we have it, the Grand Seiko SBGA211, the Snowflake. The Snowflake was first introduced in 2010, if you weren't aware. In 2017, there was a minor redesign to this model. Originally, it was called the SBGA-011, as opposed to the 211. And the difference was a very subtle change to the layout of the dial. Grand Seiko decided to change up the branding, and they moved the GS logo from the 6 o'clock side of the dial up to the 12 o'clock side. Originally, it just said Seiko up at the 12 o'clock side. This new for 2017 and beyond model is the one that we have here today. Now I'll go over the basic specs of this watch to start the review off for you guys. We have a case diameter of 41 millimeters from side to side, not including the screw down crown at the three o'clock position. We have a lug width of 20 millimeters and an overall thickness on this watch of 12 and one half millimeters. The lug to lug from one extremity of the case to the other, or the watch's wingspan, as I typically like to call it, comes in at about 48 millimeters. Now this model retails for 5,800 US dollars. That's kind of playing in the same range as uh, things like the Rolex Oyster Perpetual 39 millimeter, for example. Still, I think that, and we'll discuss it a little bit later, there's a lot of things that exceed that Rolex watch that you find here in this Grand Seiko. Now, the other basic features and specs about this watch. We have a completely titanium-based construction. The case, 
the bracelet, the case back, everything on this watch is titanium. We have a very nice AR coated, what they call a dual curved sapphire. And if I come up here a little bit closer, it's really not a very aggressively domed or curved sapphire crystal, but there's just a little bit there. AR coating, again, on the underside. This does, as I had mentioned, have a screw down crown at the three o'clock position. No crown guards on the case sides, but the crown does sort of nestle down into the case ever so slightly into a small recess there. We do get 100 meters of water resist, and we have a few other basic features, a date complication over at the 3 o'clock position, and a power reserve indicator or scale over between about the 7 and 8 o'clock position on the dial. Other than that, we're looking at the 9R65 Seiko Spring Drive movement. That movement we'll talk about more in a little bit. But uh, yeah, overall, that's the basic specifications about this watch. On paper, you might look at it and say, wow, I mean, it's really not a whole heck of a lot going here. Titanium case, sapphire crystal, air coating, okay. Well, how do we justify this 8000 or I'm sorry, $5,800 price point? Well, that's all justified by the overall quality, the fit and finish, the execution of the... Uh, the, the finishing on the case, the polishing, everything here is done really, really well. I'm going to bring the camera in here nice and tight, and we're going to take a look at that case. And we're going to talk about this titanium material that they're using here. If we look at the sides of the case, we have fully high-polished flanks and a very, very nice beveled edge coming off from the bottom sloping point of the lugs all the way up the side of the case and straight across over. The hoods of the lugs as well as the majority of the bracelet other than a few pieces of polishing are a very nice satin brushed straight line grained brush finish. Uh, it's all done very very well. This polishing is what they call their Zeratsu polishing. It's a technique that is done by hand, by eye, by feel, and it is something that I think you probably have to be a master to, to perfect. And, and clearly, whoever is in charge of doing the finishing on these watches is indeed a master. It is nothing short of exceptional, in my opinion. Now, a lot of people say they don't like titanium. They say that they don't like the look of it. I can't really tell that this is titanium holding it in the hand. To me, it looks very much like stainless steel. The only real thing that would probably alert me to the fact that it's not stainless steel is just how incredibly light this watch is. The titanium that the Seiko or Grand Seiko is using on this watch is what they call high-intensity titanium, which is supposed to be very scratch-resistant, corrosion-resistant, and 30% lighter than stainless steel. Along with the excellent, exquisite finishing of the case, it is basically the same level of detail on the bracelet. The links are, I guess you would consider it to be five link, a, a five piece link. You have outer edges and a, setter ed, uh, and a center link that are all brushed, and then two little hints of polish on the edges of the center link and the edges of the outer links as well. And if we get in here nice and close, you can see that there's a very nice beveled edge going along the sides of all of the edges of the links on this bracelet. Really, really high attention to detail. Very, very nicely executed. The sides are uncharacteristically uh, a brush finished. Generally, you would see a high polished side on, on most bracelets. So you have that little edge of polish and then the sides themselves uh, of being brushed. Very, very interesting. The clasp on this bracelet is just a dual button deployment clasp, trigger style. Uh, it's very simple. We'll talk about that more in another couple of minutes here. But I just want to show you the, the finishing of this titanium. That's really what we're trying to focus on here. Executed very, very, very beautifully. Back to the case again. The polishing on the sides also matches up with the bezel. The bezel is executed really well here. It's kind of a steep slope, but it's not a very large bezel. It's somewhat understated, and it's just portioned absolutely perfectly, in my opinion. Overall, yeah, outstanding in terms of the fit and finish of the polishing and the brushing, the overall construction on this case, this bracelet, everything. It's 
absolutely outstanding. In talking about that bracelet, I mentioned the the class, but it's kind of the only really letdown for me when we're uh, you know talking about the titanium material. And it's not that it's titanium; it's just there's really nothing super special about it. A simple two-button deployment trigger clasp opens up to a basic swing arm that's you know relatively well made. We have no you know micro adjust or anything. There is a half link on both sides of the bracelet, so that's your only form of adjustment to getting a perfect fit. They're pretty small half links. I'm guessing you could probably get a good fit if you, uh, you know, spend a little time. But overall, yeah, the, the clasp doesn't blow me away. Now, the overall decoration of the clasp is actually quite nice. You have the Grand Seiko logo sort of engraved in there. And if we can get in really, really close, you can see that there's almost a little bit of texturing on that um, matte finish around the GS logo. It does look great. It's just, uh, technically speaking, a little bit lackluster in my opinion. Interestingly, this bracelet is resized with pin and collars. Now the reason for that is because, this being titanium, I guess the, the chances of you stripping out a screw while tightening or loosening it would be, you know, something that you would have to really worry about. So. They went with pin and collars on this. I don't think that's typical for other models of Grand Seiko. I think it's just because of this titanium version. Uh, yeah, they had to go with a pin and collar system. So, you know, keep that in mind. It's uh, a compromise, but for a purpose. Now, the main event of the Grand Seiko Snowflake is, of course, the dial and the handset. Mostly, it's the dial. The dial on this watch has... What I would kind of characterize, well, no, what other people generally characterize it as is sort of a, a patch of freshly fallen snow. And I'll try to come in here real close so you can see that texture or that grain on the dial. It is beautiful. To me, though, it looks more like a parchment paper. Uh, nevertheless, it's, it's not like that's a bad thing. It is absolutely stunning. On the outer edge of the dial, we have a very simple seconds track. The seconds hand reaches all the way out to the edge of that second track perfectly. And of course you'll notice that smooth sweep of the seconds hand due to the spring drive movement. At the 12 o'clock side we have the Grand Seiko applied logo and then printed in the, uh, um, I don't know, what it's not really a cursive font, whatever that font is that they use, the words Grand Seiko. At the 6 o'clock side, of course, we have the uh, spring drive designation, and then Japan and some other really, really tiny text down there at the, at the very bottom of the dial. The indices or markers on this dial are all very, very, very beautifully done. High polished, multifaceted, hand applied. Absolutely fantastic. As a matter of fact, I'm going to zoom in nice and close here so that you can see it better. All right, hopefully that will show up on camera. You can see that 12 o'clock marker, that 11 o'clock marker, catching and playing with the light there. Uh, polished on the sides, polished on the top. Very, very nicely done. High attention to detail. The handset as well has uh, multi-faceted edges. A lot of people will kind of say like, uh, it's like a katana sword style handset. I mean, they're to me, they're Dauphine hands, but you know, the level of detail of execution and the finishing of the hands and those markers is absolutely outstanding. Of course, we also have that date complication in a, in a steel outline uh, or aperture window as well, which is nice because it sort of offsets the indice or the marker at the nine o'clock side of the dial. Everything here is just done so very, very well. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, I, I guess you don't really see this level of detail in watches at around five to six thousand dollars you know I mean at least I haven't yet and you guys can tell me down in the comments below if there's something that I haven't seen yet that sort of matches the the level of the detail and the quality and the craftsmanship that goes into everything on this watch of course we have that um, power reserve indicator over there at the bottom left of the dial We'll unscrew the crown here and talk about that power reserve. A little difficult to manipulate with my gloves on, but I'll see what I can do. Unscrewing the crown without gloves on works beautifully. Now, when you hand wind this movement, and you'll probably see the power reserve start to climb as I hand wind it, it feels nothing like a typical automatic movement to me. It's very... Uh, sort of uh, springy. You, there's a lot of feedback. You can hear it. Not necessarily a bad thing, considering this isn't a typical automatic movement, but it is different. It's, you know, 
basically it's new to me is the way that I'll go ahead and describe it. So as we hand wind the movement up, you saw the power reserve climb a little bit. Of course, you can pull the crown out to the first position to set the date and pull it out to the second position to hack the movement and set the time. I'll see if I can get it pulled out here with my gloves on. Yeah, it's, it's relatively simple to manipulate and to operate. Of course, you can set the time to whatever you want. We'll just go ahead and set it here to about 10.09. Push the crown back in, and it gets that beautiful, smooth, sweeping seconds hand up and running again. I'll go ahead and screw this crown back down. So the last thing to talk about on this watch is the movement of that 9R65 spring drive movement. Quite a technological little miracle, if you will. Now you can see that this watch is still wearing its blue case back sticker. I wouldn't dare tear that off. I'll leave that for the future owner of this watch to, uh, to remove and enjoy. This is, again, the spring drive movement. It's an automatic movement. It runs at uh, a power reserve of 72 hours or three days. It's a 30 joule movement. Of course, we talked about it being hand winding and hacking. The accuracy on this watch is outstanding at plus or minus one seconds per day or 15 seconds per month. They're no strangers to accuracy over at Seiko. Now the spring drive movement was, uh, it's been around for a long time. They started development on it in the roughly, I think the mid to late 1970s. It didn't find its way into any watches into production until the late 1990s. I believe it was first introduced into one of their higher end Credor or Creator. Seiko brand watches. The way that spring drives work is it's interesting. I mean you have an automatic movement. You can see the Grand Seiko labeled rotor there. That spins around and that winds up a mainspring barrel. What we have here is basically a governing wheel that spins and that creates a current. That current powers a quartz oscillator and the quartz oscillator regulates a braking system that slows it down to the appropriate rate and allows the watch to discharge that spring energy to move the handset. Now, in talking about the handset, you can't not mention the very beautiful, smooth sweep of that seconds hand. And this high polished, blued seconds hand, which is obviously not showing up in my lighting very well, is absolutely beautiful. That smooth sweep, that just perfect no ticking sweep is what people love about the spring drive movement. And that is what you're gonna get with this kind of technology. Most automatic or mechanical watches will run at 21,000 vibrations per hour, 28,000, some 36,000 high beat movements. This doesn't vibrate, it just runs, it just sweeps. It's a constant motion and that governing wheel is regulated by the quartz oscillator to slow it down to the absolute perfect timekeeping position or, or rate, I guess would be the correct way to put it. It's an interesting technology. Some people don't like it because it's got that quartz technology in it, but it doesn't run on a battery. There are no capacitors or power cells. It is still mechanically driven, and I think that's what really makes it very appealing in my mind. This watch is obviously not sized, so I'm just holding it on my wrist here to kind of show you what it looks like. So this is the really only negative for me. It's just a little bit bigger than I prefer. People will often say that this watch doesn't wear as large as the 41 millimeter specification might suggest, and I suppose that's true because of the shorter lug-to-lug -lug range, but it does wear kind of big for a casual watch for a watch that's not a diver, that's not a chronograph, that's not a that's not a pilot's watch. It, it wears bigger than I personally prefer. I think somebody with my sized wrist, which is six and three quarter inches, could wear this just fine with no problems, and certainly people with bigger wrists won't have any issues. But for this style of watch, for a casual, understated EDC, everyday kind of watch, I like things a little bit smaller in that 36 to 38 millimeter range. With this being at 41, even a quote-unquote small 41, it's still just a hair too big for me. Um, again, you're going to see it and you're going to comment, oh, it's not too big, it looks fine. Yeah, it, I guess it looks fine. I'm just not super comfortable with the size. And that's my only complaint about this watch. Other than that, I think it's absolutely outstanding. All right, guys, that's it. That's the Grand Seiko Spring Drive SBGA211. I'm going to jump back over to the table, or I'm sorry, to the studio view, and close out with a little bit of my final thoughts about this watch. 
Uh, but let's just take another moment here and kind of soak it in. It, it really is a beautiful watch. I'm very, very impressed with it. Extremely happy to have had the opportunity to bring it to YouTube for review. I hope you guys liked looking at it up close with me, appreciating the beautiful snowflake dial, that smooth sweeping seconds hand, all of the absolutely stunning finishing on the case, the bezel, the bracelet, everything is just, you know, outstanding, top notch on this watch. I wish it was maybe 39 millimeters instead of 41 millimeters. I would seriously consider picking this up for my collection if it were. All right, guys, there's the presentation of the Grand Seiko Snowflake. Let me know down in the comments, what did you think about this watch? My final thoughts are kind of mixed. I really do like it. I think it is extremely impressive. It comes in at a retail price of about $5,800. That sort of plays in the same range as something like the Rolex Oyster Perpetual 39mm, for example. The OP39, I think, is $5,700 if memory serves. This being at $5,800, we'll call it the same price. Would I choose this over the OP39? Well, I wouldn't choose either of them, and here's the reason why. It is just a little bit too big for my liking. The, the quality, the fit, the finish, the technology and the spring drive movement, everything about this watch is awesome. But I don't want a 41 millimeter watch that is not of the dive watch, chronograph, or pilot's watch genres. I can take those styles of watches a little bit bigger, but this is kind of a casual watch. It is a bit sporty. It could also double duty as a dress watch. In either case, when I'm looking at something like that, an EDC watch that is going to be a little low profile and understated, 41 millimeters is just too big for me. A lot of people will say this watch wears smaller than the specs would make you think. That's true, it does maybe wear a little bit smaller because it has that 48 millimeter lug to lug, uh, but it doesn't wear small enough for me. That's, uh, you know, just personal subjective taste. If I was going to get a watch like this, it would have to be 36 to 38 millimeters, something like the 36 millimeter Oyster Perpetual. That's a watch that I'm strongly considering, perhaps the Tudor Black Bay 36. For this style of watch, for this genre of watch, for the purpose that this watch would serve, it is just too big for me. Alright guys, I'm going to wrap this up and say thanks for tuning in. As always, if you'd like to support the channel, there's a number of ways you can do that. Down in the description of this video and every video I, video I do is a, a list of ways that you can help support me. You can follow me on all of my social media accounts, be it Facebook, be it Twitter, or Instagram, whichever you prefer. If you'd like to help me out on Patreon, I would really appreciate that, and a big thank you to the guys over on Patreon that have been helping me out. Finally, you can always uh, use my Amazon affiliate link. In the description of every video I do is a link to Amazon through my affiliate account. If you like anything that I've reviewed and you're thinking about purchasing it, go ahead and click that link first and I'll get a small commission. That really helps me out and a big thank you to everyone that's been using those links. Also, don't forget to help me out by supporting Exquisite Timepieces for lending me these watches that they've been borrowing in to the channel. They're a great group of guys over there, and uh, yeah, I can't thank them enough. Hopefully you guys will thank them as well. Well, I guess that's going to do it for today. I hope you enjoyed this. Until next time, I'll go ahead and say bye now.